Hey everybody, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, and it's episode number 241 of Goulet q and I'm actually shooting this about a week in advance because I am out of town right now on business, but I wanted to get a Q&A out for you anyway. I forewarned you about this last week. Last week I was a little under the weather, so my, fro my voice was a little froggy, and uh, you can tell it's still a little bit there, but I'm doing considerably better here on Friday the 18th, which is when I'm recording this. Won't publish until next week. Anyway, um, this week I'm planning on talking to you about detailing your fountain pens, uh, aligning nib tines, and then promoting the art of fountain pen use, among other things. Um, for those of you that aren't aware, if you're watching this on Friday, if you happen to be in the New Orleans area, I will be doing a meetup on Saturday, the 20, what day is that? The 26th. So this will be publishing on the 25th. Um, check out details on my Instagram or on our Facebook event page um, to be able to see what that's all about. But it should be fun to get to see a few of you in person anyway. Um, so you got some updates on product things. We got some Knox and Claire, some new ones of those coming in. We're picking up the Monteverdi Ascenza and the Prima. So you can check out those on our site. Um, we have some new Conklin Empire colors with some lower prices too. We have this new Conklin uh, vintage green. So we picked up the Conklin Crescent in black, but the vintage green, I just wanted to show it to you here. This is a little bit different for us than for everybody else because we're doing Bach nibs on them. And because we didn't want the polished steel look, we decided to put a black nib on it. So I don't know that they've had this pen with a black nib before. That'll be a Goulet exclusive. So you can check that out if you're interested in it. We haven't had a lot of Crescent fillers before. And I do have a question about different filling mechanisms, so I'll get to talk to you about that a little bit more. Um, the Diplomat Esteem is something new that we're picking up. It's not brand new, but they come out with a new color, a new red that looks pretty good, so we're going to pick up that line, that model. Um, we have a new uh, line of Diplomat Magnum colors, including one uh, pearlescent, iridescent purple that is, uh, looks really, really hot that we're going to have as an exclusive, so we're pumped about that. And then um, we have some Opus 88 tinted demonstrators, which I'm going to be talking about that one later on in this one too, but this is this, this big fella right here, uh, which is going to be in a more colored demonstrator version, which is always popular amongst our different pens. The Visconti Breeze is the most affordable Visconti pen that we'll have ever seen. I haven't seen that one in person yet, but the colors look quite vibrant in, uh, in the screen anyway, so we'll see how they look in person. And then I do have samples of the new Pilot Custom 74 colors in Mer Merlot <laughs> and teal. I was almost going to say burgundy, uh, but no, it's not burgundy, it's Merlot. Come on now, camera, work with me. So uh, beautiful colors, if it will focus. There we go. Beautiful colors. I'm a huge fan of the Custom 74, and I'm a big fan of both of these colors, honestly, very much on trend. Uh, if you want to see what it compares to the blue, which is currently available, you can see the teal as well, much more green, obviously. And then comparing the Merlot to the Platinum 3776 Bourgogne, which is a burgundy, there. You can see there, slight difference in the colors. The Merlot is much more of a pinky kind of color, as opposed to the darker burgundy. And then the teal is a nice marine green kind of color, as opposed to the blue. So. Really hot pens. I'm a big fan of those. I think those are going to be very popular. Haven't seen a ton of new stuff come out from Pilot recently, so any new colors that we have like that get me pretty excited. Uh, we also have lots of new Lamy stuff that we announced in a blog last week. You know, we've got new Pastel Safari special editions that are coming out. We've got the Bronze All-Star special edition and some of the Crystal Inks, of course, which should be coming any day now, uh, at least in limited quantities, and then we'll get better. I think we may be getting restocked on nibs sometimes in the next few weeks. It's been like nine months since we've been at most of our Lamy nibs. We may be getting more. I'll believe it when I see it kind of thing, but I think we're finally making some traction there. Uh, Lamy's had some growing pains from what I understand. Um, we also have some Pilot 100th Anniversary stuff. So we have the Seven Gods pens that'll be available individually. And uh, we're gonna offer them individually, but we're also gonna group them together as a set if you wanna have matching numbers in a set. Um, so we'll try to do that if you're interested, if you missed out on the big set. Um, and then we're going to have the ink available as well. So the little 15 mil inks, uh, brand new ink colors, uh, which is pretty exciting for Pilot. So we'll have those available in March sometime. We're going to have the Pelican Herrstuck 1929, which is the 90th anniversary of the, um, um, what's it called? The piston, basically the piston mechanism, reverse differential piston mechanism. There you go. 
Um, so that will be available uh, sometime in February. We'll have one of those, I think. And then we're getting a Graf von Faber-Castell pen of the year, which is a samurai themed. I've seen it in person and it looks nice. So pretty cool, pretty cool to be getting into this echelon of some really cool, fun and fancy limited edition pens. Again, we're definitely still like pens for the people kind of folks here. We're not gonna get too fancy with ourselves, but it is pretty neat to get to see some of these really, really cool pens and to get to show them to you all too. So um, I'm gonna try and keep it a little bit brief for this week um, just because my voice is still, I'm still kind of recovering. So we'll see how it goes, but I think I'm doing okay. If I did okay last week, I think I'll be fine this week because I feel considerably better. Anyway, I got seven questions for you this week, starting out with some pen and writing questions. First one is from P. Zucchiel. Pik Pikuziel on Instagram. If you could only have one pen from each filling mechanism, i.e. piston fill, eyedropper, cartridge converter, etc., what would they be? Uh, this is this is a bit of a toughie, but you know, I, I, I came onto it pretty quickly. Of course, I love a lot of different pens. There's so many that are just so close right there, but for the sake of actually making a decision, I decided to just go ahead and go for it. For the cartridge converter, um, of course I love my Pilot Custom 74. It's funny because I just met with Pilot. Um, John Lane was here with Pilot um, just a couple days ago. And uh, he was telling me that the blue Custom 74 is actually their most popular color. And blue is usually not a better seller than clear or even black. So the fact that the blue Custom 74 is the most popular, I was like, I'm not gonna say I had something to do with that, but it makes me happy to know that that is actually the most popular color in the US for the Custom 74, go figure. Um, and uh, we disproportionately sell more of the blue medium Custom 74s, probably because I've been talking about it for seven years, how much I love it. Anyway, I'm a big fan of that one. I do like really all the colors, um, the new colors especially. This teal though, that's gonna give a run for the, the blue, uh, the blue a run for its money, um, especially because I love that. I love that shade of teal as well, especially in the demo. So that one's really good. So cartridge converter, I love the, the fact that um, you can use the CON70 converter and it's a larger converter, has bigger ink capacity. Um, you know, the, the selection of colors in the, in the Pilot cartridges is not my absolute favorite. I, I kind of thought about, should I go with a standard international cartridge converter because I do tend to like that a little bit more. But um, anyway, just, I, I love the Pilot Custom 74. I love the way it writes. It's a great pen. So that one was pretty easy for me to, uh, to take that slot. Uh, for eyedropper, you know, I was, I was going, of course you can make a lot of um, cartridge converter pens into eyedroppers, but for me, eyedropper, I leaned towards ones that are primarily eyedropper, like really made to be eyedropper. And of course I, I could say like a Namiki Emperor, that would be, <laughs> actually that's just not a bad idea. I might change my answer at the last minute. Uh, I don't currently own an Amiki Emperor, but that would be a sweet eyedropper uh, pen to have. Um, the, the one that was the 100th anniversary was pretty phenomenal, the, the Mount Fuji one. Yeah, I think I'm gonna change my answer at the last minute. I'm gonna go with the Mount Fuji 100th anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> Namiki Emperor, but <laughs> to caveat it because I already prepped my answer with the other one, which is actually the Opus 88 Demonstrator. This is one that I actually have and use uh, on a daily, uh, not a daily, but on a semi-regular basis. Um, I like this one because it has a huge ink capacity. It's a large pen. I have large hands, so I find it very comfortable. And it's got Yovo Steel Number no. 6 nibs, which I really enjoy. And uh, I've got a broad nib on this one. So for me, it's great to have it as a desk pen. I can write my thank you notes with it, which the thank you cards that we use uh, here at Goulet uh, are rather absorbent. So they'll suck up a decent amount of ink. So having a broad nib with a nice ink capacity, you can just check the ink level just looking straight through the pen. I really like that about this pen. So that one is is up there for me. But <laughs> So maybe maybe I'll leave the Opus 88 as my my actual answer with a caveat of that that Mount Fuji uh, Namiki is pretty freaking awesome. So uh, piston pen, that one also was pretty, fairly easy for me. Of course, I love, I'm a big fan of Twisby pens. So it was right there like Eco 580 for sure. But when I really thought about it, the Lamy 2000 has to take the top slot for me. I'm a big fan. I think I own six or seven different Lamy 2000s. It's a bunch. I have almost one in every nib size. And I'm a big fan just because I, I love the pen and use it that much. Um, so I'm, um, I don't know, I just love it. Uh, vacuum, I went with a vacuum or a power filler. Um, you didn't ask specifically for that one, but I added that in there because I had a clear front runner there too. That would be the Visconti Homo Sapiens. Uh, Bronze Age is the one that I'm using daily, uh, but I have several. I like the London Fog too, but the, the Lava 
just does it for me. So I like that one. Um, lever filler. You didn't ask about this one, but I included it. I don't have a lot of lever fillers that I really love, but I do have this one that I like to break out every now and then. So this is a Waterman Ideal Pink, which is kind of a coveted vintage flex uh, pen in this red ripple ebonite. Awesome pen, looks really great. I don't love lever fillers in general, just because they're a little harder to fill. You can't tell the ink level, yada, yada, yada. It's got the ebonite feed too. Let's see if I can get a close up on that one. It's just a sweet pen. It's not gonna wanna show it. Come on, come on. There it goes. Very, very cool pen. Ebonite through and through. Uh, Flex is fantastic too. So big fan of this one. I don't have a lot of vintage pens, but this one, um, you don't see a lot of lever fillers these days anymore because it's just not the ideal. Ha, <laughs> no pun intended, filling mechanism. Um, but anyway, super cool pen. And then the Conklin Crescent um, would have to be my one. Um, this one is pretty, this one's pretty good. I like the green one, um, actually. The black is all right. Um, but the one that I love the most uh, actually, let me go grab it real quick. I'll be right back. Okay, actually I have several of these, but this one is a Tortoise limited edition that they did. This has a gold flex nib on it, which was part of the limited edition. Um, big fan of this one. It's really special. You can't get it anymore, so that kind of stinks, but it's celluloid, and it's it's uh, it's meaningful to me, so I really like this one. Um, so that would be my favorite Crescent. Uh, and that's all I got. I could go into way more types of filling mechanisms, but I thought this would hit a lot of the main ones. Um, so if you have any of your favorites, go ahead and leave them in the comments below. That won't be the question of the week, but you can always add your two cents in when you like. All right, this next question is from Chris Limmy, Lim, Limmidge, Limmy J on Instagram. Do you recommend detailing a fountain pen in a similar fashion to a car? Because for car detailing, some of the chemicals are rather abrasive. So would a fountain pen material be thick or strong enough to withstand such treatment? Um, in principle, yeah, detailing a pen is not a bad idea. Uh, in practicality, in terms of actually executing, you do not want to use the same chemicals that you would use for car detailing on your pens. They will be too harsh. Okay, think about it with a car. Your car is usually made of metal, sometimes plastic, um, but it's usually made of some type of material that's made to be outdoors and withstand things like rocks and bird poop and, you know, bugs and grime and car keys and things like that that might be scratching it. Your pens are made to be handled, but not necessarily with such the rough outdoors, right? Like it's not meant to be left out in the sun for periods of time and rained on and iced on and ice scrapers and all these types of things. Um, cars are made to withstand maybe a little bit more abuse um, than your fountain pens. So you do not want to use really harsh cleaners and abrasives and stuff like that on your pens unless you really, really know what you're doing and what material you're working with and what you're trying to accomplish. Um, cars in general will be able to take a little bit more of a beating. Um, in principle though, yes, your, your pens are still going to get dirty. It's not a bad idea to clean them and keep them maintained much as you would a car, especially if you're using it regularly and taking it out and about. Um, honestly, generally just wiping it with, you know, a paper towel that's wet, maybe with a little bit of dish soap on it will get you what you need most of the time as far as cleaning it off. If you need to go kind of a step beyond that, you can get a polishing cloth, a jeweler's cloth. We sell them, but you can get them basically at any jewelry supply place. Um, usually those types of cloth will have just a plain cloth and then have a cloth that is um, impregnated with some sort of polishing compound. Now this is gonna be much less abrasive than the type of polishing compound that you would have um, for your car but it'll still, it'll help to polish it off, especially if you're using the pen a lot. And just as you're kind of tossing the pen around, um, you know, and you're, you're getting those fine, like micro scratches just from just general handling, you know, you might wear rings and so your rings kind of clack on it every now and then. That's where this will really help. And this will polish up the metal, any fine metals on here. This will polish up any plastics, resins, um, and really won't cause harm unless you're like really, really, really polishing for a long time in one spot, kind of over polishing. But generally, something like this will work just to kind of freshen up the pen if it needs a nice shine. And especially works well on sterling silver. If you have any fine silver that tarnishes or anything like that, it can really help to polish that up well. Of course, if you're gonna polish the nib of your pen, make sure the pen is not inked, because then you'll get a nice colored polishing cloth. Um, and then if you need to go a step beyond that, you can use some fine like polishing compound, like a plastic uh, plastic polish of some kind. Um, it's something that I've thought about. I actually have, mm, do I have some one handy? I don't know. I used, to, I used to make pens, so I used to use like a plastic polish. 
Um, and you can still, you can find it around. Uh, it's not something that I would recommend because then you're really more into restoring pens at that point. Um, but it would be the kind of thing like if you get a deep scratch and you want to really polish it out, you can use that stuff. But that stuff will wear away, you know, plating on metal and stuff like that. So you want to be careful. That's about as far as I would go unless you're really getting to restoration, in which case you will be going a step beyond what I would typically cover in this type of setting. And I'm not a pen restorer anyway, so I don't know the, all the best materials, um, but there's plenty of people that do get into that kind of thing. So maybe a question for somebody that does more vintage pen repair type stuff. Cool. All right, JWJ5000 on Instagram. I recently got the Monza gift set with the three nibs and converters. Is there a good way to store the two nibs that aren't in the pen, but keep them full of ink for easy swapping? Um, so I thought this was a good question, not just for the Monza 3 set, but I've also seen Lamy Joy has a swappable set, kaweco has got a, a swappable set. There's a lot of different pen sets out there uh, that have a single pen and then multiple nib units or converters, you know, with nib units or whatever. And, and we do get asked about this from time to time. So obviously the convenient thing would be you have one pen body, you can swap out the grips, and then you can just ink and use them um, you know, all, kind of on a whim and you can keep them all linked up and go, but that's not really what it's designed for necessarily. In theory, yes, if there was some kind of cap enclosure mechanism, like let me try and pull one of these suckers out of here. If there was some kind of cap enclosure thing, then yeah, you would be able to seal it up. But the problem is you have the pen, which has the cap and essentially the pen in essence, other than the aesthetics of it, the body of it really is just made to seal up the nib. Um, that's essentially what it is. Um, so when you, you have different components here and you want to swap out between the nibs, you're replacing the guts of the pen, but then the cap stays with this part of it and then this is all inked up and what do you do with it? If you leave it out like this, the ink is just going to evaporate. It's going to dry up in a matter of hours, a day maybe at the most. Um, and then you're going to be and you're gonna have to clean the thing out. Um, because they don't include or make anything that like goes over top of the nib, it's just gonna dry out. There's no way to really seal it up. So you really basically have to clean it out. Um, you can't keep each one of them inked up with different colors and then just swap it on a whim and then be able to go. That would be neat, that would be cool. Um, but I don't know of any, I don't know of any of the sets that are out there like that, that include that, quite frankly. Um, that would be kind of cool. So I'll make that suggestion to all of the manufacturers that make these various things. In, in its essence, it wouldn't be super complicated, um, but the problem is with this specific set is the, it's the body of the pen that has the threads on it that the cap would fit onto. So I'm trying to think of like what you would have to engineer in order to seal this up. You would basically need some kind of like snap cap or something that would fit over here, which wouldn't be impossible to, to create. So I'll make the suggestion because um, I know that Yaffa, who is the brand that um, owns Monteverde and um, you know distributes them and stuff like that, they created this set. So the Monza used to be just a single pen. They mo they've moved to the three pen set. I'm, sh I'm showing you a blue one, which isn't even currently available, but will be available in the future. So they're going to expand the Monza 3 in different colors. So it's, I think it's something that's gonna be kind of here to stay. So I'll make the suggestion that they can move more towards that. And if you all support that, um, and there's some energy behind that, then, then there might be an incentive to make that happen. Um, but I just can't promise anything for the time being. Um, but in terms of other things that you could like fashion yourself, you know, I thought about maybe you could have like an ink sample vial or something like that. Like you could just, you could take an ink sample vial and like maybe, you know, shove the nib unit in there and like tape it or something. But I can't really think of anything that would be that great. Unless you have something that's really airtight and doesn't have a lot of excess air, even if you have an, an ink sample vial around there, there's still enough air that the, the ink is probably going to evaporate out of there um, and not be so great. So um, currently there's not a, not a way to do that. My recommendation to you, if you are going to be swapping in between these different nib units, is to get yourself a bulb syringe because that is by far the easiest way to do it. Um, if you want to swap it out, so you can just take the converter off, you can grab your bulb syringe like so. It's my favorite hack of all fountain pen time. You take, suck it up with water, and then you just blast it through. And like one blasting through, if it's not like completely dried up and crusty in here, like if you've inked it recently and, and it's not a, a complete restoration cleaning, um, just one blast of the bulb syringe and you'll be good to set it aside, you know? So it's not too burdensome. It just requires like a little bit of thought and, and planning, but that's what you got.
All right, next question I got. This is a troubleshooting one from JTB on Facebook. In your experience, just how sensitive is a nib to having perfectly aligned tines? For example, under a loop, if one tine is on top of the other, it's obvious that it has to be adjusted. However, when I look at many of my new pens, I can tell that one tine is maybe fractions of a millimeter lower than the other, and it's very hard to correct that. So, do they need to be absolutely perfect before going to polish the nib with mylar or something if it's writing scratchy? Um, I'm gonna say it depends a little bit on the nib, okay? Um, the harder the nib is, like if you're dealing with a stainless steel nib, you're probably gonna feel it a little bit more. Not necessarily the case with all of them, like Pelican, for example. Some of their steel nibs, like on the Pelican M200, actually has a little bit of give to it. Um, but most stainless steel nibs are gonna be relatively stiff. So any type of misalignment that you have, you can pretty much point to that as being the first, um, um, what's the word? Um, instigator, <laughs> I guess, uh, as being the, the primary instigator of your scratchiness problems. That's probably going to be the case. And that's always a thing when you're doing any type of nib training. It's like, make sure the tines are aligned before you do any type of smoothing. That's just a good general rule. And even if it's like fractions of fractions of fractions, you know, if you can tell that it's off a little bit, it doesn't take off being off much for there to be, um, you know, any type of scratchiness there. Now, what happens sometimes is usually if there's, if there's any fraction that's off, if there's not any type of a rounded edge on the inside of that nib, then it's gonna feel scratchy. That could be, maybe it just needs to be knocked down a little bit and that would compensate for that. But then you're getting into like finer points that maybe, you know, not everybody knows to do. Um, so what I always recommend is, is getting those nib uh, tines straightened out. Now what happens is if it's only fractions off and you like bend it up and then it's the other way, well you just gotta bend it back. So like it can take a little bit of practice to kind of get your tines aligned really, really nicely. But that's always a good first bet. Like 90% of the time, aligning those tines is going to fix your, your scratchy feeling uh, issues. So I, I would always recommend giving that approach um, towards doing it uh, before you do any type of smoothing efforts. Um, so yeah. Softer nibs can be more forgiving, you know, if you're dealing with gold nibs or palladium or anything like that, titanium nibs. Um, they can be a little more forgiving if they're not perfectly, perfectly aligned. Sometimes they can not be perfectly aligned but still write perfectly smooth. Sometimes they're perfectly aligned and they don't write smooth and you feel like you're a crazy person. Um, but they're often a little more self-correcting. Uh, but in general, smooth before, uh, before smoothing, align them. <laughs> I almost said the opposite. Align them first, then try smoothing. All right, Stephanie N on Facebook, on storing pens, is it possible that some storage method may damage a pen finish? Like for example, using a varnished or stained wood tray can damage some acrylic or celluloid or precious resin. <laughs> um, generally speaking, no, I've not heard of this being an issue. Um, I would say as long as whatever it is that you're storing it in has properly cured, like whatever wood finish or stain or whatever has had the appropriate amount of time to cure and you're not putting stuff in there, I would think if you have, if you just built a cabinet and the glue is not completely dry and you threw a bunch of stain on it and then you immediately threw your pens in there, you could have some off gassing, you could have some random things that could happen while the curing is still happening. But no, I've never heard of an issue, especially of any type of wood finish um, that's, that's fully cured causing any kind of reaction um, with any pen material. Though, I mean, I, I'm, I've not looked through all 150 or so years of fountain pen history to know whether it's possible there could be any type of reaction between anything. Um, but I've not heard of this really being an issue and a being of grave concern. Um, the only thing that I've really heard that uh, could be an issue is if you are dealing with any type of leather uh, that is chrome tanned. So chrome tanning is a, a specific process for tanning leather. It's definitely, uh, it's a more, a faster uh, process and, and you can do a lot of different colors with it. So typically if you have really wild colors of leather, it's probably chrome tanned or if it's uh, less expensive leather, um, not necessarily all inexpensive leather is that way or not especially not necessarily because it's expensive does it mean it's not chrome tanned so that's something always good to ask but it's specifically towards sterling silver so if you have sterling silver accents or sterling silver pens stored in chrome tan leather pen cases then they will tarnish the sterling silver more rapidly um, and that's about it. That's the only issue that I've really heard in terms of pen storage um, needing to be gravely concerned. Now, obviously when you're storing your pens, you wanna make sure that they're you know, in a, in a 
cool, dry place, I'll say. If they're overly humid or if they're in a particularly warm place, that's not really good for any pen, especially if it's a pen with like any types of glues or anything like that. But that's not really particular to the storage unit itself. You know, it's not like you need to have these things stored in a humidor, uh, but you know, having them stored in, you know, a not airtight place up in your grandma's attic that gets 120 degrees in the summertime, not the best for a pen. So that's not necessarily the, the storage containers problem. That's more just the environment that it's being stored in. Um, so that's really the only thing to be aware of. It was a leather thing. I wanted to mention that to you. Um, and then just in general, storing it at room temperature in a reasonably comfortable environment. You should pretty much be okay with most types of pens. Okay. All right. Got a business question. This is from Rughagar on Instagram. Rag Hugar, forgive me if I can't, I just can't pronounce anything today. Due to the advent of computers and smartphones, the skill and or art of writing has been on the decline. What do you think we should do to encourage all the people of the world to pick this lovely art? Having beautiful pens is one thing. Having something beautiful to share is perhaps the other more important one. Lots of hashtags in there. Very hashtag friendly question. Um, you know, honestly, I, I am one who I appreciate the tools as much as the craft. So there are definitely some people in the fountain pen world where fountain pens are really just whatever. It's more about the artwork that I can create with them, whether that's calligraphy or, you know, urban sketching, bullet journaling, you know, drawing, artistry, you know, stippling, cartooning, whatever it might be. So that's, that's one thing. Um, me personally, I appreciate the tools themselves as much as I do what's created with them. So I just know that I'm kind of biased towards that. I love pens because they're beautiful and they're functional and tactile and all these types of things. And then writing to me is almost like, it's like a benefit. <laughs> Even, you know, obviously the pens are the vehicle for doing the writing, um, but I enjoy just the having and feeling and using the pens as I do the end result of what's actually created. And maybe that's just because I'm not particularly the best artist. So like what I, I do okay, but um, my handwriting and stuff, it requires a lot of work. <coughs> Excuse me. But there's others out there like, uh, you know, I think about Liz Steele, who's an urban sketcher. You know, she shares her passion. She does a lot of that, um, you know, and, and for her, it's more about, you know, the art that's created. And I think about bullet journalists and stuff like that. You know, Kara Benz uh, comes to mind very quickly. She has a lot of very beautiful pens and showcases them for their beauty, but also creates beautiful things with them. She walks that line nicely. Think about others like calligraphers, Jake Weidman, Michael Saul. Um, they're really able to teach others and connect with others. So I think for me, what it all boils down to is, it's not that writing is more or less important, it's that the medium is shifting, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So it's more about um, writing in terms of the tactile, I have to, you know, the only method of communication is I have to write a letter and then send it to someone, you know, thinking about like the kind of the stereotypical, like someone's away at war and you write letters back and forth to each other and it takes months to get there, that kind of thing. Um, that's not really the case anymore, you know? So writing in itself has kind of changed in its own purpose. And I'm talking about handwriting specifically. It's changed in its own purpose. So yes, writing is on the decline in terms of its utility because not as many people have to write things down with a pen on paper as they used to. And the industry is kind of adapting to that, you know, the educational system is still trying to figure out how important is that. That's kind of shifting even within the school system. Um, many would argue, yeah, it's on the decline because it's just not being taught as much anymore, especially cursive. Um, but I think that it still has its place. And especially from my perspective, being in the fountain pen world, of course, fountain pen people are going to be more on the enthusiast end of it. So they're going to just evangelize and share that more because it tends to be the the magical pool that everybody collects into who really loves writing um, to the nth degree, those are the people who are gonna be gonna like fall deep into fountain pens and calligraphy and these types of things. So, you know, I live in a very biased world, but I, I know that is not representative of the greater world as a whole. Um, so for me, I think the answer to really your greater question here is how do we share 
this wonderful passion with the rest of the world? And the, the answer is to share it and to share it within the medium that the rest of the world is actually using. So if you look at bullet journaling as a medium that has really risen in the last five years, um, you know, thanks to Ryder Carroll creating that system, he was, he was looking for a productivity system, used all different types of medium, settled on the pen and paper as the way to do that and has written a book and has done a lot of great things and huge social media following around that has actually done quite a bit to promote um, handwriting in and of itself uh, just through that productivity method. You know, I look at, you know, what we've done here through social media, through videos like these to promote education. I look at Jake Weidman, Michael Saul using social media. Um, I look at outside of our industry, looking at Bob Ross, big fan of Bob Ross. Rachel actually has this app that has Bob Ross, like recordings of Bob Ross's, um, you know, Joy of Painting show uh, as a like fall asleep thing. So like we'll like fall asleep to Bob Ross talking about happy little trees and these types of things. Um, but I've watched plenty of it on Netflix and stuff. You know, think about how many people got into painting um, because of the, the education, whether you love or hate Bob Ross or his show, what he did was he taught. So I think using education and teaching and showcasing uh, through whatever the medium of the time with Bob Ross, it was television because PBS and the television at that time was the best medium to showcase that. These days, you could argue whether it's television, but certainly social media and there's tons of people on Instagram doing live video and broadcasts and Skillshare classes and these types of things. Um, there are so many mediums now for your average person to showcase the artwork they do, it's it's really spread the breadth and depth of um, the ability to teach and learn from each other. You know, I look at now even um, 10 years after I had basically stopped making pens and I haven't done a lot of woodworking in the last 10 years, that was another passion of mine, but I look now at all the YouTube videos and educational stuff that's out there about woodworking. When, when I was first into it, it was pretty much New Yankee Workshop on television, on PBS. And that was about the only woodworking show. And there's the Woodwright shop for like hand tools and stuff. Uh, but that was about the only woodworking stuff that was anywhere near mainstream. Um, and then now you look at all the stuff that you can find, you know, for free on the internet and through social media. It's like, it's just amazing. So any hobby or passion that you are interested in now, you can dive deep into it. So while you can definitely make the argument that writing in general is on the decline, I think the passion of writing and the purpose of it has changed a little bit and the medium has actually opened up quite a bit um, in some ways. So is it great that not a lot of schools are teaching cursive writing? You know, you can make, you can make that argument since I'm incredibly biased. I would say, no, it's not so great. But at the same time, there's way more tools out there for us to connect and share with each other. So I think that, um, you know, I would be remiss to say, yeah, we're entering into the golden age of writing. Eh, it's hard to say, you know, but if you want to get into writing and you want to share it with others, it's never been easier, never been easier to do it than right now. So um, I'll leave off by saying that I'm a big proponent of teaching as a way to spread the joy of any craft. And it's never been easier to do that than through your very own phone in your pocket. All right. And the last question I have for this week is a personal one. This is from Susan Beth C on Instagram. Do you have favorite pens for different tasks? For example, do you have one pen you use for journaling, another for quick notes, and another for signing legal documents? Do your children use fountain pens for any of their homework assignments? Um, so yes, I do. I kind of lean towards certain pens for certain tasks. It's not that I like will only use them for that reason, but I do definitely gravitate towards some. Um, so I keep a fine or an extra fine Lamy 2000. I'll kind of swap them out. Um, always with Noodler's Black um, by my nightstand for journaling. I use a Some Lines a Day journal just to write down, hey, this is what happened today. Just little little blurbs, a couple sentences. Um, so I will keep that uh, by the nightstand because Lamy 2000 holds a lot of ink. It'll last a long time without drying out, um, which is good for when I'm only writing a little bit each day. Um, that pen works really well for that purpose. And I enjoy that pen. So that one works out really well. Um, I do carry the Homo sapiens around with me um, pretty much every day, as well as my um, little traveler's pen. The traveler's pen is more of my knock around pen. Like this is the one that I'll leave in my pocket as I'm mowing my lawn, you know, and I have a big lawn, so I'm really putting it through its paces when I'm doing that. This one, I might take it out of my pocket when I'm mowing the lawn or scraping the ice off the car or whatever, but this, this little knock around thing, the traveler's pen, I use that pretty much whatever because it's solid brass and you cannot hurt this thing. Um, 
What else do I do? Um, Lamy Safari or Vista. So I'll use that for when I'm doing ink reviews, which I haven't done a whole ton of them recently, but I did a number of them back in the day. I like this pen for ink reviews, first of all, because it's clear and I can see what's going on, um, but also because it's just a pretty standard, well-known pen that a lot of people are familiar with. So I know if I'm doing an ink review with like a fine or a medium, you know, Lamy steel nib, it's gonna be pretty well recognized and appreciated. Um, so that's why I like to do that one for ink reviews. Um, when I'm doing uh, note card writing, which is actually probably one of the more significant portions of my time spent writing, is doing thank you notes um, that we ship out with all of our orders here. Um, so that I tend to lean towards broader nibs. So I'll use uh, Twisby, either Eco, Eco T, something like that, um, with a broad nib. Those I'm a big fan of. The Opus 88 Demonstrator, I like that one because I can see my ink capacity. And it's got, I love the way that that broad Yovo nib writes. Um, Conklin Endura, I've been using that one a lot lately. I have the Ebony one. Um, this is another exclusive that we have. This one has a Yovo broad on it as well. That tends to work out really well. Uh, and then what else? The, yeah, those ones. Those, those three really end up being my main note writing pens for the moment. The Endura is a relatively newer pen. So we'll see how long it sticks in the rotation. But ever since I got it, a month and a half ago, two months ago, it's been pretty heady in the rotation. So it might, it might stick. Um, and then most of the other pens that I have, I'm, I'm rotating them out, you know, because I'm in kind of a unique position where it benefits me tremendously to have a really wide, unique, varied experience with fountain pens so I can compare them to them all and kind of put them all in perspective and that you can trust my assessment of them when I start to talk about them. Um, so I need to be rotating them out, using them in all different scenarios. So it actually doesn't benefit me tremendously to kind of pigeonhole certain pens for certain purposes. It helps me when I swap them out. So. Um, you know, even the ones that I've mentioned here, I may rotate them in and out. The Lamy 2000 one is the one that I've kept the longest in its position. Um, and then the Homo sapiens I'm carrying around quite a bit as well. Um, but don't hold that as if, I, if that ever changes, be like, oh, I don't know who Brian is anymore. You know, it's just because I'm trying to vary up the experience a little bit. But I've definitely sort of gravitated more towards what I really enjoy in recent years. And then the second part of your question, do your children use fountain pens for any of their homework assignments? They, they do, um, not like religiously. It's not like we only have fountain pens in the house and they have to, you know, I want it to be fun for the kids and I want them to really enjoy it and appreciate them. So they have a few pens, you know, they've got um, some of the, like the school kind of starter pens, you know, like they've got a Pelican, uh, Pelicano, which we don't even sell, but I had some, so I gave it to them. Um, they've used uh, Pilot Varsities. Um, they have some Jinhao Shark pens, which they really love. So yeah, they'll rotate them in and out. They like to use me and Rachel's pens, which we let them use selectively with supervision, depending on the pen and what it is, but they'll use Twisbees and stuff like that. So um, definitely they're, they're fans of, of fountain pens. Um, not like super deep, super crazy into it, but I think, you know, pretty much you can't be doing what we do full time here without like being known as the pen people. So yeah, I mean, our kids, they definitely associate themselves with the Goulet Pen Company um, and, and people know that we're the pen people. So yes, we'll use them, but I'm not pushing it on too hard because um, I'm not looking forward to the backlash that will come in the teenage years as a result. Maybe that'll never happen, but I don't want them to be like, oh, dad, you talking about pens again? <laughs> That's just how I'm assuming my kids are gonna talk when they get older, but anyway. Hopefully, hopefully they'll they'll enjoy it and never really get sick of them. But I'm trying to keep it fun and interesting and just kind of sprinkle it in, you know, planting the seeds, more or less. Whether that's the right approach or not, I don't know. Who who knows? But either way, they know they know full well um, <laughs> that the food on the table comes from pens. So they definitely appreciate them to a larger degree uh, in many many different ways. And that is unique to the Goo Littles, as we like to call them. Um, but yeah, it is pretty cool. And they like, they like the fun pens, they like the fun colors of pens, and they like the fun ink that you can use with the pens. So um, I've found that that's a pretty easy way to introduce it into them is, you know, like my son, you know, he loves, loves Pokemon and Pikachu is his favorite. So we got him like a yellow shark pen and he can use whatever color ink, you know, red ink and a yellow, you know, pen, um, very much Pikachu kind of thing. Of course he saw the Pikachu um, Lamy Safari, which is a Chinese exclusive and we can't get them. I'm trying to get my hands on one, but, um, anyway, that thing is really cool. Um, so that would be like kind of the ultimate for him, right? So it's something that your kid can get interested in, especially associating a color to it. Uh, it could be really kind of fun. So anyway, that's what's worked out well for me. Um, my question of the week for this week is what are some of your favorite artists who you follow online? So people who are doing, you know, writing, uh, ideally something writing related, but maybe not. Maybe somebody else who does some other type of craft or just something that, someone who inspires you through what they're creating or what they're teaching. 
um, online, whether it's YouTube, Instagram, or whatever other medium. I'd be really curious to know, just in general, like, who do you think does a really good job, and who have you learned a lot from, and who's kind of like, you know, the Goulet pens of whatever other um, kind of art artistic medium that you follow. I'd be really curious to know what that's like, and then you can all, you know, link up to each other and share and stuff like that. It's kind of cool. So that's all I got for you for this week. I hope you've enjoyed this one. If I happen to see you in New Orleans, that'd be amazing. But uh, otherwise, uh, I'll be back the following week for more Q&A. Thank you so much for watching, and right on. <laughs>